Good day to you. Hope you're having a wonderful day. I want to talk to you about greed. I want to want to define greed for us. I want to talk about some issues with greed. And then I want to talk about how we can avoid greed. There's some things we can do to try to work against or avoid you know, being greedy and letting that set up in our hearts. And then I have some final thoughts just from what we have in God's Word, just some final things to think about. So to start off here, what is greed? Okay, now greed, the definition, if you look it up, you're going to get maybe more than this, but I'm trying to give us like a summary because I think we I think we kind of understand what greed is. It's an intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth or power or food. It can be, again, it can go with gluttony, but we've we've discussed gluttony. Synonyms for greed. Now, I'm thinking primarily of greed for riches, wealth, power, that type of thing. Um, Synonyms for this are avarice, covetousness, because it can be a covetous thing, materialism, predatoriness, meaning that we are willing to prey on others to get it. It can be money grubbing, insatiability. It could be that we cannot be satisfied. That's a lot of times greed leads to never being satisfied. Self-indulgence. And again, piggishness. Also, that can again apply to gluttony. We These things go together. Greed, it makes us stingy. It makes us selfish. It makes us only want for us. That's that's what greed is about. It's a very selfish thing. We don't want to. We're stingy. We don't want to give to others. And then we're selfish. We want everything for us. So, so what does the Bible say? That's what we really care about. What does God say about greed? One thing that we can find in Ecclesiastes in chapter 5. Now, this is verses 10 through 12. And this is from the Amplified Bible. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its gain. This, too, is vanity or emptiness. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what advantage is there to their owners except to see them with their eyes? The sleep of a working man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach greed of the rich who hungers for even more will not let him sleep. The drive, the desire, the lust for wealth and riches can become overcoming. I mean, overwhelming, can be overwhelming. You know, it can become our God. And and he says here in verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied. No matter how much you have, if you're if you're feeling that greed, if you make that your God, if you make that what you're chasing after, you will never be satisfied with it and your abundance will never be enough. You will never be filled because it doesn't fill your heart. It doesn't help your your spirit. And, you know, when we increase our money, when we increase our money and our wealth, then we just seem to consume more. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but the more money we make, we just seem to consume more. We use it for more. Um, so what's the advantage? And if you get things, more possessions, then there's no advantage to having more more possessions except, like he says in verse 11, to see them with their eyes except to look at them. I don't know about you, but I don't want a bunch of things just sitting around to look at. Um, I find that then I have to dust them and keep them clean, and it's really more trouble than it's worth. So <laughs> I have my I have my own thing about that. <clears throat> and notice that the sleep of the working man is sweet. You know, somebody who works and, and just earns their money, and they come home, and they're tired, but they've made enough, and they're content, and they're happy with who and what they are and where they are and with God's blessings. They, you know, they eat, they go to bed, they go to, I don't know about you, I'm tired when I go to bed. I'm, I'm ready to go to sleep and, and I sleep good. And the, but the full stomach of the rich, you know, and, and this is being referenced as in they're full from their greed, but it's never enough. The greed, that, that greedy stomach, you know, it's not a real stomach. It's a speaking of greed. 
it just hungers for even more. And they, they are never really resting or restful. They're always wanting more. So, as I said, the drive, the desire for wealth and riches, it can become overwhelming. It can become our God. What we chase after to the exclusion of all else, and we don't want that. It's an obsession. It is deceptive. And it can be sneaky the way it creeps in on us. You know, we need to be careful that in our quest to, like, better ourselves and our families, you know, we want to we wanna improve ourselves and we want to make things better for our family. We want to improve their lives. That's normal and natural. There's nothing wrong with that. But we want to make sure that we don't accidentally get lured into the love of money or the, you know, the seeking of that goal of wealth and status. We must have it, you know. When you get lured into that point, you've gone too far. Back off of that. You know, it's time to come back away from that. Money itself cannot provide happiness. It's not a true source of security. Um, The more we have, the more we spend. And like a drug, we will need more and more to satisfy that greed. It's just like like a drug. You're just going to keep needing it. And it's not... Like I say, it's not a true source of security. God is our only true security, our only true source. But greed is never satisfied. It will always crave more. It will always want more. So, we want to look at some of the issues with greed. I'm sure I'm not going to touch all of them. Greed creates a lot of issues. But I'm just going to maybe just touch a little bit here. Um, if we look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, now everything I'm reading is from the Amplified Bible. So I want to say that again to make sure that you're aware of that. But this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other, meaning he'll choose one of them that he will really love and he will hate the other, or he will, you know, he will really follow and be devoted to one and he will hate the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And in this case, they say mammon would mean money, possessions, fame, status, wealth, or whatever is valued more than the Lord. So anything we put and value higher than the Lord is a problem. We know that. But in this case, we're talking about greed. I'm going to stay focused more on, on money, possessions, valuables, things of that nature. Fame and status can also play a part in this. So we don't want to, you know, don't want to just totally blow that off. But on the other hand, I'm really trying to focus more on what we consider to be greed, more about that materialism, that money, that sort of thing. So we want to make sure that we do not replace God with money, that we do not make money our idol, We do not want to make anything, possessions, fame, or status, our idol. None of those things can become, can be before God. We cannot have idols before God ever. Or, we cannot look to these things as our source of happiness, of safety, or blessings. These things are temporary, they're fleeting. Now, money can be a good resource, and I don't want to act like it's not. Money, like food and water and clothing, it's a good resource, it's a good thing to have, and that's how we should look at it. It is something on this earth that is good to have. It's nice to have a home, it's nice to have a bathroom in your house, (laughs) if you've ever had otherwise, (laughs) you know. um, But these things, these are earthly things, and they're fleeting, they're temporary, they're just for here and now, they're just a resource for us in the here and now, while we are here before we go home. And Jesus warns us here. This is in Luke chapter 12, and it's verses 13 through 20. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Jesus said to him, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over the two of you. Then he said, to the crowd. He said, watch out and guard yourselves against every form of greed. 
For not even when one has an overflowing abundance does his life consist of, nor is it derived from, his possessions. In other words, your life is not about how much you have and how much you know, wealth or possessions you have, what you have. That's not what your life is about ever. It should never be about that. So now, even though, now we, we're, we've we stopped here and we're going to continue on, but even though it might see, seem unfair to us in a worldly way, how Jesus told this guy, look, I'm, I'm not your arbitrator. You know, I'm not, you know, it's, and he says, watch out for greed because this guy's coveting what his brother has. Um, you know, we must not be greedy or covetous for what others have. Instead, we need to look to God. He is our source. And that, that is the initial main lesson to get right there is that, you know, this guy is coveting what his brother has and he wants some of it. Whether that be fairly or unfairly, I do not know. And, and Jesus probably actually knew. <laughs> I'm just going to say that Jesus probably knew. I mean, he, he knows our hearts, so I'm going to say he knew. Nonetheless, he still told him, you know, I'm not, I'm not being an arbitrator over you. And he says, watch out for greed. So he knew this man was coveting what his brother had and most likely unfairly. But, um, whether it seems fair or unfair, we need to remember that we don't need to be greedy. Or covetous. Instead, we need to always look to God. He is our source for everything. He will help us. He will take care of us. So I'm going to continue on with verse 16. Then he, the Lord Jesus, told them a parable, saying, There was a rich man whose land was very fertile and productive. And he began thinking to himself, What shall I do since I have no place large enough in which to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my storehouses and build larger ones, and I will store all my grain and my goods there. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many good things stored up, enough for many years. Rest and relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. Just celebrate continually. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own all the things you have prepared? See, here Jesus shows us a man who was greedy and selfish to the point that he missed out on God's blessings. Not only can he not take this stuff with him, because as we say, this is just for here. This is just resources for here while we live here. You can't take it with you to heaven. But here God had blessed this man with good land and great harvests. His storehouses were full, and now his harvest was overflowing. But in his greed... He neglected it, greed and selfishness, okay? His greed and selfishness. He neglected to share his abundant blessings from God. And yet we know there were poor. There were those who needed it. The very reason we are blessed, especially to such an extent as that, is so that we can share those blessings with others. It's not so that we can store it up. I mean, what are we going to do with it? How much is enough? When do we say, hey, that's more than enough. I need to start, you know, sharing this and giving this out to people in need. You know, so he wasn't learning the lesson. And here God had blessed him so richly and he missed the point. He missed the whole point. Because of his greed and his selfishness, he had it was it had become to that extent. Now. So that's that's some of the problems with greed right there. I mean, we we get greedy we get selfish, we become stingy, we, you know, we don't share, we don't bless others, which is what we're supposed to do. And we make our possessions, our money, our wealth, we make that our God. We make that what's important to us. See, he was storing all that up because it was important to him and it made him feel safe and secure and happy. But see, that's not where we should get our security, our safety, and our happiness. Our happiness should be doing the Lord's work, which we will continue on and talk about that, which part of that is sharing with others. So how do we avoid greed? Okay, how do we avoid it? Well, the simplest answer is by practicing the opposite. Practice generosity. Like anything else, 
when you do it and you, you get in the habit and the practice of being generous and helping, then you will get better and stronger at that. Now, Jesus encourages us here. Now, this is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves material treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, that on which your life centers, will be also. So see, we need to be storing up treasures in heaven. How? By helping others here. Showing God's love here. By helping others here. God blesses us. He stores He stores blessings for us in heaven. And because our treasure is in heaven, that spiritual treasure, because that's in heaven and that's where our heart is, our heart is to be with God. We want to be with God and we're storing our treasure there so that we can be there then that's what our life will revolve around. And the more the more we do this, the more we're generous, the more we help and do for others, the better we will get at it. It's like everything else. We start off, maybe we're a little rough and not too, not too good, <laughs> but we will get better with practice. Everything takes practice. So we store treasures in heaven by helping others here. You know, God blesses us and he stores those for us. Now, also note what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians. This is chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing, come in abundance to you, so that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in Him, in God, and have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. Now notice, have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. That's what our abundance is for. As it is written, and forever remains written, He, the benevolent and generous person, scattered abroad, He gave to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. That is how God looks at that. He scattered abroad, he gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, he who provides seed for the sower and bread for food, this being God he's referring to, of course, will provide and multiply your seed for sowing, that is, your resources. He will grow your resources so that you will have abundance to share and increase the harvest of your righteousness, which shows itself in active goodness, kindness, and love. Again, you will build and you will get more abundant and more abundant as you do this, as you practice your generosity. God will see to it that you grow and you build. If we share our abundance, then we are rewarded here as well as in heaven because that abundance will grow. It will continue to grow for God is our source. And again, this is how we show his love to others. Now, if we go back and notice what God tells the Israelites back in Deuteronomy. Now, this is chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. If there is a poor man among you, one of your fellow Israelites, in any of your cities, in the land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not be heartless nor close-fisted with your poor brother. But you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend to him whatever he needs. Beware that there is no wicked thought in your heart saying, The seventh year of release, remission or pardon is approaching, and your eyes hostile, unsympathetic towards your poor brother, and you give him nothing since he would not have to repay you. For he may cry out to the Lord against you, and it will become a sin for you. You shall freely and generously give to him, and your heart shall not be resentful when you give to him, because for this generous thing... The Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy, and to your poor in your land. This is God way back commanding this. 
He is commanding them. You could easily just say, you know, one of your fellow Americans or one of your fellow citizens or whatever. You know, we should, they're, they're our fellow people. They're our fellow people here that are poor among us. And we should not be heartless and close-fisted with them. But we should freely open our hand. And he says generously lend. And back then they had a thing on the seventh year. They would forgive all loans. They would forgive all loans and debts. On the seventh year you would be free every seventh year. Um, that's part of how our bankruptcy used to work. It was based on a every seventh year cycle. Um, so in a weird way it was based on this. Not exactly, but you get the idea. But here... They would, you would be released from any loan every seven years, any debts, anything like that. So he was saying, even if they w- would not be able to repay or would not be required to repay you in any way, your your eyes should not be hostile or unsympathetic towards your poor brother. You know, because then it would become a sin for you. So you shall freely and generously give to him, and your heart shall not be resentful when you give to him. Because for this generous thing you do, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all your undertakings. And then again he says the poor, the poor will never cease to be in the land. God says this. This is just a fact. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy, to your poor in your land. If we care about the plight of others, and if we give to others, and if we will be generous and open our hand to the poor, and see their plight, then we will, we will not, we will not be greedy. You know, when we're doing this good work and following God, we will not, this will help us combat any, any greediness we might have. As Christians under the New Covenant, you know, can we do any less than what the Israelites were commanded to do themselves? No, we should be practicing generosity and benevolence. We should always be practicing generosity and benevolence as is within our means. Notice, within our means now, we don't want to take money away from our families. We don't want to take food off our tables. I understand that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about using the blessings that God has given us, the abundance that we have to share with others. The more we do this, though, the more we practice our generosity and benevolence, like anything else, the better we will get at it. It will strengthen our faith and our knowledge of God's love because we are acting in faith and in obedience to Him. We will just become better and better at it. And it will also help us and cause us to love and identify more with people in need, as we help them, it will help us grow in that way in love towards our fellow man. And, you know, if you still feel selfishness or greed, you know, creeping back in, there's a short, there's a short um, verse you can remember, Proverbs uh, chapter 22, verse 9, He who is generous will be blessed. For he gives some of his food to the poor. You can think of that as he who is generous to the poor will be blessed, for he gives to the poor. He he helps the poor. He gives something to the poor. It's a very simple, short verse, but it gets right to the point of what God is telling us and what he told them back in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. Now, there's another thing we need to do to combat greed as well. Practicing generosity is a good way. That's a good start. But there is another facet to this because greed also has its flavor or um, has its, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. It has a part of covetous, covetousness to it. It has a bit of envy and jealousy tinge to it at times. So what we need to practice here is we need to practice contentment. Being content with what we have, with what God has blessed us with. Because God has blessed us with so much if we just will take note of that and realize that he has blessed us and, and be content with what we have to start with. Now, 
If we read here in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, Let your character, your moral essence, your inner nature, be free from the love of money. Shun greed. Be financially ethical. Being content with what you have. For he, the Lord, has said, I will never under any circumstances desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So Paul is encouraging us here, be content with what we have and understand that the Lord is with us always. He will never desert us or leave us helpless or leave us lacking and needing and wanting. You know, he will always be here for us, and we can be content with what we have. Because we do have the Lord. The Lord is our source. God is our source. Remember, God is with you. He is with you always. The Lord is always near. And we can be content with the blessings we have. You know, money and possessions are not our source. The Lord provides everything we need and more provides abundantly for us. He is always with us, always caring for us. And we need to heed this teaching too. From from Paul to Timothy, this is 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 6 through 10. We need to this again having to do with contentment, but godliness actually is a source of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Now, That contentment which comes from a sense of inner confidence based on the sufficiency of God, being content with what God has given us and knowing that he will still supply us and keep us. You know, that doesn't mean we can't, that we don't do our part and we don't do our work and we don't do our job. It just means that we know that God will always supply us, supply us away, supply us with what we need. Um, He will open a door for us. There is always a way that God will supply us so we can be content. I'm going to continue on because I only read you one verse. So, For we have brought nothing into the world, so it is clear that we can cannot take anything out of it either. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. So in verse 7 he says, For we brought nothing into the world, of course not, and we can't take anything out, all these possessions and everything, we can't take that with us. It's, it's just resources and things to use while we're here in this life. But those who are not financially ethical and crave to get rich with a compulsive, greedy longing for wealth fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, leading to personal misery. For the love of money, that is the greedy desire for it, the willingness to gain it unethically, is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through and through with many sorrows. So we want to make sure that we don't get caught up like these people. The desire for wealth and riches can drive us to evil acts. Instead of, you know, instead of being having that desire, that uh, covetousness, that that longing, you know, look around, appreciate the blessings we have. Just stop for a minute, thank God for everything we have. Look at what we've been given, and be content with what we've been blessed with. That's so much of what Paul is getting at here. He's He's telling us to be content because godliness is a source of great gain when you are content with what you have and start from there. Being content with what God has given you doesn't say you can't improve upon your lot you know, and improve upon your circumstances. Just start off being content and then work to improve and don't get lured into this deception that money and wealth is your ticket, because it's not. It can be a good resource for you. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't, you know, don't start thinking it is all you need, because it's not. God is what we need all the time. There will always be, okay, there will always be someone richer with a better car or a boat or a house. But we need to remember more importantly, that there are always those who are poorer 
and need our help. That is way more important. If we can learn to be content with what we have and help others, then I think we can resist greed and selfishness. It does, it does take work and time and effort, but it can be done. Now, as some final thoughts, I have some scriptures here that I want to read, and I, I make some small comment, but not a lot. Um, I just want us to notice these further instructions given to Timothy by Paul. Uh, these instructions do apply to us. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present world, instruct them not to be conceited and arrogant, nor to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share with others. In this way, storing up for themselves the enduring riches of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. We need to focus on this teaching. This teaching is very similar to what Jesus was telling them to do because, of course, Paul is following Jesus. So he's going to tell us a very similar thing. He's going to tell us basically the same thing. That we should not rely on riches, but rely on God. And be rich in good works. Be generous. Again, this will help us combat that greed if we're generous and willing to share with others. In this life, on this planet, we are the rich. We are blessed and richly blessed. And we need to be, just as it says in verse 18, rich in good works to be generous and willing to share. We need to remember that this is what God wants. It's what our Lord requires. The Sermon on the Mount, the basis and establishment of Jesus' ministry, Okay, that is what... That sermon is. Jesus is laying out the basis, the, the foundation, the basic tenets and beginning of his ministry. Okay, And his ministry is our ministry. We have no other ministry. We have the ministry of Jesus. He is our, his ministry is our ministry. If we're teaching something outside of his ministry or that goes against his ministry, then it's wrong. Okay, that's just point blank. I don't think any of us would disagree with that. So, here's what he instructs us to do. So, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor, your fellow man, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love, that is, unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you so that you may show yourselves to be the children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on those who are evil and on those who are good, and makes the rain fall on the righteous, those who are morally upright, and the unrighteous, the unrepentant, those who oppose him. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that? And if you greet only your brothers, wishing them God's blessing and peace, what more than others are you doing? Do not even the Gentiles who do not know the Lord do that? You, therefore, will be perfect, going into spiritual maturity both in mind and character, actively integrating godly values into your daily life, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, you can also read Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36 for a very similar um, accounting of this message from the Sermon on the Mount. But, you know, the questions we have to ask ourselves is when we read this, do we understand these verses, you know, what the Lord is teaching here, that we should love our neighbor, that we should love our enemies, that we should be like God, our Father? Notice, to be like God the Father, he makes his sun rise on those who are evil and on those who are good, and makes the rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Our God blesses all with his love and goodness. We need to be perfect as our Father is perfect. We need to bless and help those that are poor and in need. And it doesn't really matter if they're Christian or not. We need to do these things. 
we are told to do these things plainly and simply right here that we should we should do good for these people we should always do good for them just like our our father in heaven and that's part of exercising our generosity is exercising our generosity to others it's also part of our ministry the lord's ministry to bless others to bring them to the lord so notice here again what god says through isaiah god is being critical of Israel's superficial and hypocritical fasting practices, and he tells them what he would rather they do than fast, what would be better and correct in his sight. This is in Isaiah chapter 58, and it's verses 6 through 11. Rather is this not the fast which I choose, to undo the bonds of wickedness, to tear to pieces the ropes of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and break apart every enslaving yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into the house, when you see the naked that you cover him, and not to hide yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your healing, restoration, new life, will quickly spring forth. Your righteousness will go before you, leading you to peace and prosperity. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from your midst the yoke of oppression, the finger pointed in scorn toward the oppressed or the godly, and every form of wicked, sinful, unjust speech, and if you offer yourself to assist the hungry and satisfy the need of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness, and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your soul in scorched and dry places, and give strength to your bones, and you will be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. God is telling us what he wants us to do what he wants of us, to care for others, to not be greedy and selfish. Again, the easiest way to combat that greedy and selfishness is to be generous. You can build your generosity up. You can build it like any other action or muscle by putting it in use, by practicing it, by doing it. That's how you build that up. It's the same as with your faith and with your love, with everything. Contentment is much the same. Practice contentment. Look around you. Be grateful for what the Lord has given you. Look for the blessings that you have. You know, grow your gratitude and your contentment and give give thanks to God always. So, I want to thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And remember, God loves you.